Uh, coming up, we have Nader Al Naji, uh, co founder of Basecoin. Uh, just a little bit of background on Nader. Uh, he and his co founder went to Princeton, uh, where they graduated uh, undergrad from computer science. They were both cuma sum laude, uh, sorry, summa cum laude. Uh, they worked in high frequency trading at DE Shaw. And after that, they worked at Google for two and a half years in ads and search as software engineers. So Nader has a presentation. Nader, if you'd like to come to the stage. There you go, man. All right, cool. Yeah, thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you so much, Greg, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, yeah, just one correction. We actually have, uh, have two co-founders, uh, Lawrence and Josh, um, but all very similar backgrounds. So before I get started, um, I'm, I don't actually have slides. This is just one slide. It has um, our website, my contact information. And actually, because we're at East West, there's a, a Chinese white paper for the natives in the room. I, I don't know if it's actually good. Um, so maybe if you, if you don't like it, let me know so that I can stop showing it to people. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, how many guys here own tokens, just out of curiosity? Wow, everybody. All right. So uh, I, you know, I'm really excited about crypto taking over the world. Are you guys excited about that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, you should be. Um, but um, you know, this is why one reason why I think we think stable coins are so important is we actually think they're instrumental to this takeover of the world of crypto, that this dream that we all have. Um, and the way you see this is, is essentially you look at volatility in tokens today. So if you look at all the tokens that exist today, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the other ones, uh, essentially they are fixed supply. Uh, that means that you know B Bitcoin essentially 21 million, you know Ethereum essentially fixed supply. And the problem with that is that they can't respond to fluctuations in demand without corresponding fluctuations in the value of the unit. Right? So if demand goes up for Bitcoin, the price of each unit has to go up. And this volatility causes lots of problems for the most basic financial contracts of our, in our economy. Um, so I'll talk about those in a second. But the first thing I want to point out is this volatility will never go away. Um, it'll go down, but I'll repeat it again, it will never go away. As long as a currency is fixed supply, even in the long run, there are fluctuations in demand, and its volatility is very unlikely to go below about 10%. The way that you can see that is by looking at gold. Gold has been around for thousands of years, yet its volatility is about 15% if you look it up on the internet. And 15% um, is far too high for the thing to be used as a currency, so I'll explain why. Now, if you go to a store and you want to buy something, right, that's a very quick transaction. The storekeeper can tell you, give me this many bitcoins, you give them the bitcoins, you get out. That's not very, you know, that's not too negatively affected by volatility, right? With 15% volatility, that might work. But where you really get killed by volatility is anywhere where time is involved in a contract. And you'd be surprised how many applications, how many basic financial contracts involve time. Things like loans, things like salaries. If you have a salary denominated in something with 15% volatility, let's say it says uh, we have a salary and it's one Bitcoin per month. Right? So what, what happens if you have 15% volatility over time? Right? Well, either the purchasing power of the currency is going to go up, in which case your employer says, hmm, I'm kind of paying this guy a bit too much. I want to renegotiate the contract. I want to fire this person. That's a problem. Or it goes down, in which case now you're basically poor or you're hungry or something like that. So the problem with time when you have it in a contract is if the volatility moves against you, at any point during the term of a contract, either you get screwed or the counterparty gets screwed. So even low amounts of volatility, like 10 or 15 percent, totally preclude the formation of credit markets, of the most basic financial contracts in our economy. So now we kind of get into, you know, what happened historically, right? Historically, society started with fixed supply. They actually started with gold. But society's money evolved. And it evolved to have an elastic supply, and there's actually a very good reason for that, which is that most economists know this. Elastic supply is how you get rid of volatility. When you have an elastic supply, you can fight fluctuating demand with fluctuating supply to keep the value of the unit stable. This is how all the central banks work today. All, most fiat today works with this very basic concept, and we actually think it's a feature, not a bug, right? So, now we'll talk about kind of Basecoin, right? So what is Basecoin? Well, to understand Basecoin, let's, let's understand what Bitcoin is, right? 
Bitcoin was a massive technological innovation. Um, and its innovation was that it gave you the ability to run a database without an owner, an ownerless database, right? So you think, okay, that sounds stupid. Like, why is that, <laughs> why is that actually important, right? Well, it turns out to be really, really, really valuable when you're trying to run a money database for that money database to not have an owner. Because any time you have an owner for a money database, that owner gets the temptation to modify the database, you know, modify a row here or there to either give themselves billions of dollars, to seize the assets of others, right? Essentially, society really only trusts governments to run a money database, right? They're, we have to kind of get together and elect these people to run it, but even that, even that doesn't really get there because they still have the temptation to modify that database, right? So Bitcoin said, you know what? Now you can run a money database without an owner. And it was a huge breakthrough because you never will have this problem again of someone tampering with the money supply, someone seizing assets. It's a huge breakthrough. But Bitcoin has, you know, Bitcoin didn't get us all the way there, right? It reproduced gold, right? It, it made it its fixed supply, right? The rules of its database are just a little bit too simple, right? What Basecoin says if, is if we take this model, a decentralized database, we, we modify the rules just a little bit, right? We can take it from the gold, the evolution into fiat, into the USD, right? And so this is now how Basecoin works. We take the ownerless model of Bitcoin, right? We take the, the database that runs with a fixed set of rules, and we just change the rules in two very simple ways. The first is we get a price and exchange rate between the token and another asset uploaded to the blockchain in a decentralized way. I can talk about how we get it in a decentralized way later. Just imagine mining, but instead of mining blocks, you're, you're actually uploading an exchange rate, like something like that. But getting that exchange rate onto the blockchain is the first step. And the nice thing about the Basecoin system is whatever exchange rate you give it, it'll keep it fixed. So if you give it an exchange rate between Basecoin and the dollar, right, then it'll actually keep every Basecoin with a dollar, but in the long run, you can transition to give it an exchange rate between Basecoin and, let's say, a basket of goods or a consumer price index, and Basecoin will run totally autonomously, growing and shrinking the supply to keep that peg. I went a little ahead of myself, but the first thing we do is we upload an exchange rate to the blockchain. Initially, it starts as Basecoin to dollar. Long run, Basecoin to basket of goods. So that's the first thing we modify. Second thing we modify is actually very simple. We just make the rules of the blockchain expand and shrink the supply in response to that exchange rate. So that exchange rate is on the blockchain. We're growing and shrinking supply to keep the price stable. Very simply, when the price of the token is above a dollar, supply expands to push the price back down to a dollar. When the price of the token is below a dollar, supply contracts to push that price back up to a dollar. So, that sounds very, very simple, and it, it, it actually isn't very complicated, but I'm going to go a little bit more detail into how we actually do that. Um, the amazing thing about the Basecoin system, the thing that gets everyone so excited, is what it's doing is totally autonomous, but at the same time analogous to what existing central banks do. And I think you'll see that as I describe it. So what Basecoin does, I'll, I'm going to explain contraction and expansion. When we need to contract the money supply, which happens when the price is below a dollar, the blockchain issues a second type of token in an auction called a bond token. And people buy this token with Basecoin. It puts the bond tokens into circulation. The Basecoins get taken out of circulation in exchange for those bond tokens. Blockchain creates them out of nothing, creates bond tokens out of nothing, sells them for Basecoin, takes the Basecoin out. Very simple. Then, when it needs to expand supply, all it does is it, it needs to create new base coins. So what it does is it just pays back those bond tokens that it created at a rate of one base coin per bond token in the order that they were issued. So the reason why you might buy a bond token is because you can buy it in the auction for less than one base coin. So you can say, bid 0.9 base coins for this bond token. Your base coins get taken out of circulation. Then, when you eventually get paid back, you get one full base coin, so you earn a yield. So this incentive to buy the dip and then make money when base coin has to expand in the future is fundamentally how our system works. Actually, you can think of it as an interest rate. When you're paying 0.9 base coins for a bond that's going to pay one base coin in the future, there's kind of an interest, a yield of 1 over 0.9, right? And that's like an interest rate mechanism. 
And that's actually exactly what central banks do today. They buy and sell government debt, they, they manipulate that interest rate in order to take money out of, the, out of circulation, put it back in. So there is one more little wrinkle in the base coin system, which is that bond tokens are only created when we're contracting the supply. Which means that if you're expanding, 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 a lot of base coin need to be created, you might have a state where you want to create base coin, but there are no bond tokens to pay. Right? So who do you give the free money to? Right? And that's where we have a third and final token. It's called a share token. And it's fixed supply. And all it does is it captures the free money when there are no bond tokens to be paid. So imagine there's 100 share tokens. It's fixed supply forever. It's scarce. So there's 100 share tokens in circulation. And let's say we have to create 200 base coin. There are no bond tokens in the queue. Then each share token would get two base coins each. It's distributed just pro rata like that. Now, that's the entire base coin system. Contract, create bonds, sell them for base coin. That's how base coins get taken out. Expand, pay back those bonds. If you don't have any bonds to pay back, the share tokens get paid. And this is a really, really interesting system, especially the share token. Because if you think about it, the share token is actually capturing all of the upside of the base coin network. It's like we took Bitcoin, which is an unstable currency, and split it into a stable piece and an upside piece that's volatile. The stable piece is like base coin, that upside piece is like this share token that we've created. And this is really cool. I mean, if Basecoin, for example, let's dream for a minute, expanded to the entire money supply, right, that would be a very nice, you know, that would result in a lot of Basecoins being paid to the share tokens. Uh, it's kind of like having a piece of the Federal Reserve. Um, and so that's the Basecoin system at a high level and how it works. And um, yeah, we think that, uh, you know, in the long run, right, so remember I talked about how we get an exchange rate between the token and the dollar. In the long run, we transition that to an exchange rate between the token and a basket of goods. Remember, that exchange rate is uploaded in a decentralized way. When that happens, the system is, ap is operating totally autonomously, stabilizing the price relative to a global basket. At that point, it becomes what we, what we really call an algorithmic central bank, which is a stable cryptocurrency, not owned by anyone, not manipulable by anyone, but that allows and enables all of these most basic financial functions of our economy. And that's what Basecoin is. So I'll take questions now. Uh, yes? So the question is, why did we choose to pay back bond tokens in the order they were issued? In other words, a first in, first out order. The answer is we considered many, many, many different schemes. Schemes where you pay back bond tokens uniformly, schemes where you know, you, you, you know, bond tokens don't pay one base coin, they just keep getting paid and paid and paid and once they're created. Um, the short answer is, um, while some of those schemes may work potentially, uh, they're not as good as the, the first in, first out queue for various reasons. Um, but more, more importantly, they're very difficult to analyze. So the base coin system with the first in, first out queue, we've actually done a very, very thorough amount of research analyzing the system. That analysis is enabled by the fact that this first in, first out queue gives it nice properties that you can actually price bond tokens, whereas they become much harder to price if you do anything else. There's no way, I mean, we haven't figured out a way to do uh, pricing of, or analyzing the system with any other configuration. So that's the short, uh, short answer. Um, yes? Um, he says, what, what do I think the total supply of base coin could be? Um, well, um, you know, initially there's an initial market for being like a tether, uh, or rather being used on exchanges for inter-exchange arbitrage. Um, that's actually a billion dollar plus use case. And um, the, you know, the owners of Tether, Bitfinex, actually don't want to operate Tether because they lose money on it. The reason they operate it is because um, it subsidizes about 30% of trade volumes across exchanges. So replacing that is something that actually we've gotten a lot of inbound from exchanges uh, to want replace, to replace Tether. Um, and so that's funny because one exchange operator said, normally uh, tokens have to pay to list, but we would pay you. To, to, to solve this problem for, for our space. So that's the initial use case, but the other use cases are so much bigger. Um, there's the offshore banking system, which is about $10 trillion. That's basically people just kind trying to keep their money in an unseizable jurisdiction. They probably don't want to use Basecoin for the fluctuations that it provides, but imagine if they had a dollar equivalent. Why would that $10 trillion offshore banking system need to exist, right? 
Um, and then there's the distributed app economy. So we see CryptoKitty is actually a great example of a distributed app, um, but there are many others like Augur, which is a prediction market. Uh, time is involved when you're betting on something, so anything that's uh, like that requires it, and it's Filecoin obviously requires it. Nobody wants to keep an unstable token. So Basecoin can be the checking account of the distributed app economy. Everyone will keep Basecoin. They can go into other tokens as they please. Um, and that's tens of billions, you know, easily over 40 billion. Um, but the real, real use case for Basecoin is hyperinflating economies. Economies where people, uh, their local currency is inflating, it's losing value, it's kind of being seized in this subtle way. And um, in these economies, right, a lot of them are actually switching to Bitcoin right now, right? We see Venezuela and Zimbabwe, some of the worst economies switching to Bitcoin. And what we think is interesting is we think Bitcoin is a gateway drug to Basecoin. Um, and the reason why that is, is basically imagine what's going to happen in the first really big crash in Bitcoin. A lot of these people are going to say, hmm, you know, I kind of wish that I had something that didn't crash all the time, that didn't fluctuate. Uh, whenever they try to actually do loans, any, any kind of financial contract over time, which they'll want to do very quickly, uh, that volatility is going to be terrible for that. So, you know, they're, they're going to learn about Bitcoin, say, I love Bitcoin, and uh, then realize, hey, you know, I like crypto, but Basecoin is, is probably more useful, right? Um, and so that's a trillion dollar plus, right? So that's really the, the dream, the, the, the moonshot. Um, and so our market, yeah, that's what we're shooting for. So, uh, yeah, over there. Uh, the question is, how do we determine who gets the new base coins? Um, so the system is very simple. The people who get the new base coins are the ones who uh, locked up, like who bought the bonds, right? So if you participate in buying base coin during a dip, you are rewarded, right, by, you know, by getting, you know, more base coin than you put in uh, after, uh, when we need to expand supply, right? It's literally what, by the way, this is how all central banks work. Right? When they want to contract supply, they sell bonds. When they expand supply, they just buy back the bonds. Right? Exactly the same thing. Um, and so the priority is the more that you participate in promoting stability, the more money you make. So it's really using capitalist incentives to promote stability in the most elegant way that we know of. Um, so I think I was told that's my last question, but um, I'll be over here uh, if anyone wants to talk to me. So, yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, man. That's great.